The Islam that the Mahdi brings is something which is almost unrecognizable to most Muslims. And so they have to be aware uh, of this fact. And uh, they have to examine uh, anybody who's claiming to be the Mahdi or to be a messenger from the Mahdi because God does not want anybody to believe blindly. Uh, but they should also not disbelieve blindly because in it might be their destruction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brother, Dr. Afan. Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. How are you today? I'm good, alhamdulillah. It's good to have you here. Thank you for having me again. So uh, today we're going to talk about an interesting topic and it's an important one. And we're going to talk about Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam. What is Imam al-Mahdi? What is the meaning of his name or this title? Uh, who is this character? Where did he come from? What is his story in the narrations of the prophets and the messengers? And most importantly, in the narration of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi in his holy household. And uh, what does he do? Um, and why do the Sunnis and the Shia disagree about the identity and the narrative of this character? Uh, we'll start with you. You were born and raised a Sunni Muslim. Your family's from Pakistan. Uh, they were very religious. You were religious growing up, and uh, you continue to be uh, religious. So I'm sure you've learned about uh, Imam al-Mahdi or came across him. Why don't you tell us, what do Sunnis believe about Imam al-Mahdi? So the subject of the Mahdi it was one that was really brought up in the environment that I grew up in, which would be occasionally going to the mosques on a Friday. Uh, the subject was very much to do with what you mentioned in the previous episode we did, which was the kind of more, more mundane kind of rituals that you had to abide by, a couple of stories of the companions. But the topic of the Mahdi would come up occasionally, you would hear the name Mahdi and it would just kind of spark an interest about this character. and. Certainly with me, it resonated very deeply. And uh, what I would do is I would probably go to one of the sheikhs or one of the imams of the, the, the mosque that I was with, and I would pose questions to them, and then they would reveal who this character was. And it was a messianic figure uh, in Islam that would come, and uh, at a time where there was chaos and disorder and lawlessness and crimes, and he would essentially return the, uh, the nation of the prophet to its pure roots which had become corrupted. And it would uh, be a descendant of the Prophet. Um, I learned that he would be from the line of uh, the, second, the, the second Imam, Imam al-Hassan, and that in one night this character who didn't know who he was, would uh, knowledge would descend upon him in one night and uh, then the next night he would be the Mahdi and he would rile up uh, his forces and troops and then make a revolution uh, that would give victory to the Muslims over their enemies once and for all. Yeah, so uh, Imam al-Mahdi, uh, he's an Imam uh, for the Muslims that appears in the end time. And his title is Mahdi because um, he is the one who is guided and he guides. And Mahdi means, uh, you know, it, it comes from guiding or guidance. And uh, uh, the Mahdi in Sunni Islam uh, there's a very big difference between what is actually written about the Mahdi and narrated in hadiths on the tongue of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu and then between the assumptions that the scholars have made, you know, to kind of piece together, um, you know, the picture about this character and to understand his function. And so uh, some Sunnis believe that he descends from Hassan, Imam al Hassan. Uh, so he's a descendant because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he only had one daughter, Fatima. Fatima, he marries her to his cousin Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatima to Zahra alayhi wa sallam. They have two children and that are, and those are al Hassan and al Hussein alayhi wa sallam. Those are the two males that they, that they have. 
And some Sunnis believe that he's a descendant through Al Hassan, and some believe that he's a descendant through Al Hussein, and others just don't know. They just know that he has to be a descendant of the Prophet. Um, they say that his name uh, is the same as the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm sure you've heard this a lot and they're yes. always going on about this. You'll always find yeah. Sunnis as saying, oh, well, if his name is not Muhammad, son of Abdullah, then it cannot be the Mahdi because his name, the Prophet said, it has to be the same as his name and has to be, his father's name has to be the name of his father. Precisely. Um, but yet the actual hadith that the Prophet states, he says that his name is like my name and his father's name is like my father's name. And so there's a very big difference between is the exact name and between like the name. So it is possible that his name is Muhammad, son of Abdullah, but the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he had a whole host of names. He was Muhammad, he was Ahmad, he was Mustafa, he was Mahmud, he was Abdullah, right? So uh, then if we understand it, that it's like that, mm -hmm. the literal meaning of what the hadith is, that it matches that or it's like that, then the Mahdi's name possibly could be Ahmad. Uh, the, the the if it's if it's like the if his father's name is like the 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 father's name you know of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam then it could be abdullah you know and it could be abdullah for the mahdi just like it's abdullah is the name of the father of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but it also could be ismail you know because the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in another narration he says that you know I am the son of the two sacrifices, meaning uh, mm -hmm. uh, Abdullah because Abdul Muttalib had offered him as a sacrifice to God as a Nazar, and also uh, Ismail. The narration states you know uh, that he's the you know the son of the two uh, sacrifices, meaning Abdullah and Ismail, because also Muslims believe that. Ismail was the offering of Abraham. And we know that the Prophet is a descendant of Ismail. So now uh, the name of the father of the Mahdi could be the name Abdullah. It could also be Ismail. It could be any of the Prophet Muhammad's uh, f grand grandfathers that came in between right. Abdullah and Ismail. Or it could be a name that is like Abdullah, mm. Abdul Malik, Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahim, you know, Abdul Halim. It could be uh, any of these. So we don't have a consensus amongst Muslim scholars that it is exactly this. But what you do have is you have a lot of fear mongering scholars that always want to, um, mm. you know, jump at the attempt to belie anybody who claims to be a Mahdi throughout history. And so they always kind of point this out and stick to it as a, as a point where they're, where they're, they're saying, Oh, well, that guy's claiming to be the Mahdi. He can't be because his father's name is not Abdullah or he's not named Muhammad, son of Abdullah. Right. So they limit it. They kind of eliminate listening to any da'wah unless it matches word for word their expectations that that they have in their minds. Without paying attention to the hadith that you mentioned where it says like. Very yes, clearly. exactly. It says mm -hmm. like, you know, or matches um, or similar to. It doesn't it doesn't say that it is exact. Right. And uh, we can also uh, place even at this point. Um, the uh, the hadith on the screen so that people could see uh, the the exact wording in Arabic uh, that it uses and how it actually uh, translates over. It was narrated by Abu Dawood and Al Tirmidhi from Abdullah ibn Masood, who reported that the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, "If there was only one day left of this world, Allah would prolong that day until He sends forth a man from me or from my family whose name will be similar to my name and his father's name similar to my father's name. He will fill the earth with justice and equity, just as it was filled with oppression and injustice." So the Mahdi he comes, and uh, the Sunnis they always also state that anybody who claims to be the Mahdi is not the Mahdi. Mm. And uh, this is also a fallacy. And the reason why it is a fallacy and it's not valid because it doesn't actually go back to any uh, narration. Like there's no narration that states 
that the Mahdi doesn't know who he is. Mm -hmm. uh, but rather, these are the conclusions and the conjecture of the scholars. Um, and they're basing it off of a couple narrations. Uh, one narration uh, states that God fixes him in a night. Mm -hmm. God fixes his matter in a night. And so they say, okay, well then the Mahdi one night, he doesn't know that he is the Mahdi. And the next day he does know that he's the Mahdi. God gives him a dream or something or, uh, you know, reveals to him in some way, shape or form, just makes him know uh, that he's the Mahdi. So it's like an overnight thing before he doesn't know. But also um, other scholars say, you know, no, fixing his matter in the night means that he was a normal human being. He had sins. He lived a normal life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and, and maybe his, his uh, you know, that like he was, he, he did some bad things. You know, he maybe was drinking. He maybe was doing drugs. He maybe <laughs> did other things. And then God reforms him in a night. Right. Immediately, he, he, he gives his heart to God in, in one night, and that's what it means by God fixes his matter. Another interpretation that they have is that, is that no, um, you know, what it means is that like, like things are just not going well for him. He doesn't have the support or what he needs to emerge and fulfill his duty as a Mahdi, but overnight, these abilities are given to him. So maybe, uh, he wins the lottery or something or, or, you know, he just gets a, a, a big supporter that, you know, somebody of great power or authority backs him backs just him. in the same way that, you know, the Pharaoh of Egypt backed uh, Joseph, right? Overnight. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes like an opening, uh, for him. Right. The other hadith that they use to claim or come to the conclusion that the Mahdi is oblivious of, of who he is, is the, the hadith that states that he basically um, is moving along and people are coming to him and they're saying, you're the Mahdi, and mm -hmm. they're trying to pledge allegiance to him, and he's refusing to accept uh, their pledge of allegiance and he runs away from them and then they chase him to the place that he goes to and they kind of force pledge allegiance to him. And so they say, okay, well, why is it that the Mahdi uh, would reject their pledge of allegiance, mm -hmm. you know, unless he didn't know who he was, um, you know, and and so then uh, but the problem with that is that like it wouldn't really make him uh, much of an imam, would it? Uh, because uh, here uh, in his followers are more knowledgeable than he is and they have more divine insight <laughs> than he does for for the recognizing who the caliph is and the mm -hmm. imam of the time is when he himself uh, doesn't even know that he's the imam of the time. So what would be the purpose then uh, if they're more knowledgeable than he is that they that they follow him? Right. Because obviously they understand God's will better, better than, than the imam himself does. Mm. But self-contradictory then. It is self-contradictory. And it doesn't make sense too um, that, that he would even have people that are actively pursuing him and wanting to pledge allegiance to him and perceiving him as being the Mahdi without uh, there having come a period before where he was propagating his ideas and his theology and his belief uh, system and his da'wah. Therefore, the people become, uh, you know, have certitude that he is the Mahdi. And and also this idea that they recognize him and they come and they pledge allegiance to him would be against the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and all of the prophets and the messengers because there was no prophet or messenger from the time of Adam, you know, or divinely appointed Imam or Hajjah from the time of Adam all the way until the Mahdi uh, that ever just appeared amongst the people in creation, just recognize who they are and they willingly, um, you know, want to go and, and, and pledge allegiance to him and, and support him. But rather we find that, you know, it's God who has to 
command mm. the angels whom are kind of objecting to the creation of Adam altogether. And God has to tell him, I know more than what you know. I know better than what you know, or I know that which you do not know. And so they, in obedience after the Mahdi, the, the Adam being identified to them as a, as a caliph of God, then they prostrate. And the same thing happens with all of the prophets and the messengers. They either are identified like John the Baptist, uh, you know, baptizing Jesus or a messenger identifying like Moses identifying Aaron to the public or like in the case of Rasulullah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, which the Mahdi is supposed to be upon the same way as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, the Prophet appears he recognizes himself first because he has this divine experience where Gabriel, uh, mm. you know, tells him to read and begins to give him the revelation. And it is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam who begins to propagate the message for 13 years uh, uh, amongst the people in secret. And so they hear about his dawah and then they mm. pledge allegiance to him. And then they, he builds a strong base of support. That's enough that he goes out in his first battle against the disbelievers. So if we assume that the Mahdi is going to come in the same way as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then he has to know who he is and he has to, um, you know, uh, have had a period where he's giving dawah uh, to the people first. He may not have been born and he probably wasn't. And it would make sense that there was a time period where he didn't know that he was the Mahdi because the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, and he's the best in, uh, of all creation, uh, was not born knowing who he was. It took him 40 years, right? So the Mahdi mm -hmm. too, uh, it could take him, uh, he might not have been born knowing who he was. He probably didn't. And he most certainly um, you know, didn't propagate his dawah until a particular point. And, uh, yeah, the reason why he might have been escaping from those people is maybe he didn't know if they had his best interest in mind or if they were true believers or not, or maybe they were coming to pledge allegiance to him in an inappropriate time, you know, or in an inappropriate atmosphere sure. or place where there's other people that are on looking that could have caused them harm. Yes. And the idea that the Sunnis have where they hold on so tight, uh, many of them, to this idea that he comes from the lineage of Imam al Hassan, this is also conjecture. It's just assumptions uh, that are based on the fact that uh, a lot of these scholars do not like the fact that Imam al Hassan rebelled mm -hmm. against the uh, Umayyad Khalifa Yazid. And so they say because Imam al Hassan made peace with Muawiyah, he is more worthy of having the Mahdi come from his lineage. So this is also just a nonsense uh, assumption that does not go back to uh, narrations, narration. authentic narrations from the uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and his household. And so uh, the Mahdi and Sunni Islam, uh, they pledge allegiance to him and he uh, moves forward and he frees. Well, first, uh, there's an incident where Jesus, uh, the son of Mary, comes down upon him while he's with uh, his congregation. So the Mahdi now had engaged in several wars and he had been uh, fighting against the non-believers. And uh, then there comes news that the Antichrist has appeared. And so right. Jesus now reappears. And they say that it happens in Damascus in some narrations right. where he descends uh, from the clouds with each one of his arms hanging off of the backs of angels exactly. and he's dripping water from his forehead and all this. And, uh, and the Mahdi says, Oh, Jesus, you just came down. Please lead us in prayer. Jesus says, No, it's your time now. You be the one that, uh, leads the prayer, you yes. know, and Jesus prays behind, uh, Imam al Mahdi, yes. uh, which also is, um, you know, an indication that a lot of Sunnis don't pay attention to. But uh, the fact that, you know, uh, the, the Mahdi is greater in Islamic theology than uh, Jesus, the son of Mary, and he's higher than Jesus, the son of Mary, because you can't have somebody uh, leading as the Imam in prayer 
uh, you know, a profit unless he was higher than that profit. That's an impossibility. Right. And it's really interesting to hear the uh, Sunnis kind of explain that away in the different ways that they do, uh, which is that, no, the Mahdi is not greater than Jesus because he's, it's the Sharia of the prophet, the, the, the jurisprudence he came down with, which is superior. And therefore that's why he leads. Actually, Jesus is greater. And <laughs> it's these kind of funny things. And the other point on this narration, which I think is extremely important is that a lot of the Sunni Muslims, unless they see Jesus coming down on the wings of two angels supporting him with, with things dripping down his hair and uh, they will not accept unless they see something like this yeah and, and you have scholars that also said like they warn the people and they say oh you know never pledge allegiance to the Mahdi until you see first the people um, you know agreeing upon him and gathering upon him right and so um, if everybody's going to follow that advice and nobody's going to uh, be the first to pledge allegiance to the Mahdi and the Mahdi has no da'wah from beforehand, then who are these people that come down from the heavens and, and you know, are these aliens that just mm. appear out of thin air that recognize the Mahdi without him having a da'wah, without him even knowing who he is, um, you know, and with him, even after they try to pledge allegiance to him, hey, he's denying it and saying, I'm not the Mahdi. And they're just so full of certitude and faith that they continue. So, uh, yeah, there's a big difference between what is actually said about the Mahdi and what the scholars, the conclusions that the scholars uh, make up in order that they prevent Muslims from searching for or recognizing the Mahdi. Uh, many years ago, uh, I was in the Islamic Society of North America's headquarters um, in Plainfield, Indiana. And I remember that the then, uh, you know, president was there and he was, there was a question that was posed to him by a Lebanese Shia woman. And it is the Islamic Society of North America is Sunni. And the question was, you know, are we living in the time of the Mahdi? And instantaneously, uh, he gives a response, which is that, no, this is not the time of the Mahdi. The time of the Mahdi is going to come like 2,000 years from now. Right. And so the audacity, the boldness, um, the lack of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these scholars have when they're answering questions that they have no knowledge, uh, you know, uh, that they're basing it off mm. of. The Prophet never indicated that uh, there was going, he never stated the year. So for him to say that it's like 2,000 years in the future, future, how does he know that it's not, uh, that he's not tomorrow? So the scholars, they lie and they lie a lot regarding the topic of Imam Mahdi because Imam Mahdi terrifies him. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to look down the narrations that have reached to the Muslims about the character of the, of the Mahdi, maybe we'll uh, discover together why it is the case. Yes, I'm saying, and I really hope it's my sincere wish that those who are listening in on us can really understand that these scholars really are instruments for confusion and uh, they they don't represent the, the hadith and the narrations and it's all conjecture as far as they're concerned. Yes. That's, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, for the most part, the majority of the important information that has uh, reached um, the Sunni Muslims about um, the Mahdi. Yes. Uh, there's not a whole lot more. Uh, there are certain other narrations that indicate that there are three sons of different caliphs. Right. Uh, maybe it's the descendant of Abu Bakr and the descendant of Omar and the descendant of Imam Ali that are all like fighting, fighting each other. Each and other. the Mahdi is the descendant of the Imam Ali. There's these references to uh, these descendants and other people would disagree and say for sure not. The descendants of the Sahaba are loving one another even until the, the future, thousands of years into the future. Um, but... Uh, that's, for the most part, what has been narrated uh, that's important about the Mahdi in Sunni Islam. Yes. Then we have the narrations which have reached us through the household of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Through Imam Ali Alayhi through Fatima Al-Zahra, 
through Al Hassan and Al Hussein and the Imams that come from uh, their lineage uh, that speak about the Mahdi, and they are a lot and in much more detail. And in the Shia traditions, uh, these, and when I say Shia traditions, I mean the narrations that uh, are accepted by the Shia, that are rejected by the Sunnis, because they are not traditions that come from the companions that were alive at the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi alone, but rather they come from uh, the household of the Prophet and it's only narrated by them and by their descendants. And so they identify that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi has explicitly stated uh, that the Imam al-Mahdi is the 12th Imam from uh, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after the Prophet Muhammad. First Imam is Imam Ali, and then there's Imam al-Hassan, then there's Imam al-Hussein, and after, after Imam al-Hussein, it's his son. So it's father, and then son, then brother, mm-hmm. and then the son of Imam al-Hussein, Ali Zayn al-Abidin, and then Imam Muhammad al-Baqir, and then Jafar al-Sadiq, and then Musa al-Qadim, and then Ali al-Rida, and then Muhammad al-Jawad, and then Ali al-Hadi, and then al-Hassan al-Askari, and then it's that twelfth who is Imam al-Mahdi, Muhammad ibn al-Hassan al-Askari, alayhi salam. So, who is this Mahdi? Uh, this Mahdi is a Mahdi that came to the people, according to traditions of the Shia. And uh, because the enemies of the Ahl al-Bayt, starting with um, you know, the Abu Bakr and Omar and the Umayyad dynasty and then the Abbasid dynasty, they were constantly trying to kill each and every one of the Imams. And so for that reason, you find that after the Prophet's death, Imam Ali and is, is killed. Um, then Imam Hassan is killed. He's poisoned. Mm-hmm. Uh, each, each of them, really the person who's responsible is Muawiyah at the end of the day. And then the son of Muawiyah, uh, kills Imam al Hussein, slaughters him and his entire family. And then they continue to kill and poison and imprison each one of his descendants until the promised Mahdi. Then the promised Mahdi at a young age, in order, uh, uh, God, uh, in order to protect him, God hides him. Uh, he raises him, uh, you know, and is going to return him once again in the end times. And so uh, the Shia are waiting for this Mahdi that's already been born and that has an extremely long life uh, span. He's alive right now, much like um, the Sunnis might believe that Al-Khidr is still alive today. They believe that the Mahdi has lived this long lifespan and that it's not against um, you know, the sunnah of Allah because Noah had a long lifespan and God also raised Enoch and he raised Jesus. And so in the same fashion, uh, the Mahdi mm-hmm. is taken away from the nation only to be returned in the end time. So that's interesting because the the Sunni view on the Mahdi is that he's a random person that's going to be born in the end times, right. but he's a descendant of the Prophet. In the Shia tradition, he's a specific individual who's a descendant of the Prophet. He's a 12th descendant from the Prophet, and he's raised just like Jesus is raised. So now we have the Christian uh, Messiah and the Muslim Savior, both of them having uh, you know, been raised and, and, and taken away. And then they return back in the end times, and they are together, working together. Uh, for the same cause. Right. Yes. Other traditions from the Ahl al-Bayt mention, uh, now because they're very rich and they are very specific, they start speaking about other individuals that are appearing around the same time of Imam al-Mahdi. One of these characters is called the Imani, And the Imani we need to do an entire episode on. And we need to do an entire episode on the Qa'im also. And why is there a difference between the Qa'im and between the Mahdi? And and point out how in the du'as and in the hadiths of the Ahl al-Bayt, they themselves, the, the, the household of the Prophet, made a distinction 
between these characters that the individual of the riser or the qa'im is not the same as Imam al-Mahdi, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Askari And that these individuals who are appearing in the same time as the reemergence of the 12th Imam, they pave the way for Imam al-Mahdi. And some traditions even state that these people uh, these Shia, these these helpers, these these uh, uh, you know the the Imani, the Qa'im, and other characters that they actually are the ones whom go through most of the battles, opening up the way for the twelfth Imam to where that when the twelfth Imam does receive his kingdom, he would have not personally, he wouldn't have spilt a drop of blood. So that's a very different look mm. at this Imam Mahdi mm. than uh, the Imam Mahdi that the uh, Sunnis right. uh, believe in. Now, what does Imam Mahdi do and what does he face? In Sunni Islam, they believe that the Mahdi, his, his main fight is against Jews. And I'm sure you've heard about this, right? Yes, uh, certainly the, there is a... Now that you mention it, there was this understanding that he will come with a force and uh, he will come from the east. Khorasan is mentioned as well. And uh, as he moves uh, westwards, uh, there are uh, various enemies, but the goal is really to get to Israel, what, what we call the land of Israel today, and uh, to, to fight against and take the fight to the Jewish people who have become oppressors in the land. Okay. So in Sunni Islam, one of the main purposes, if not the main purpose, of the Mahdi is to kind of like unite uh, the Islamic nations and free Palestine right. from the Jews. And the narrations are very specific that in his time, you know, things are getting really bad between uh, the West and between the, uh, you know, the Jews and the Muslims. And that it gets to a point where uh, the people in the West, uh, they kill or imprison or deport every single uh, Muslim man, woman, or child. And a lot of the people that are watching what's happening in the world right now, they're seeing and they're recognizing that there is a parallel between what is taking place where in the West, uh, in response to what is taking place in Palestine and mm-hmm. between Palestine and Israel right now and between uh, uh, and, and because of all these terror attacks that have that have happened that there are individuals that are going out like this guy uh, that stabbed 26 times a Palestinian boy mm-hmm. or uh, you know uh, other incidents of violence that's taking place against Muslims or the deportation of um of three people from France that were uh, waving Palestinian flags or going, you know, this and these these new policies and laws that are coming into effect that if you are pro-Palestinian, that you're going to lose your residency and, and be deported. So mm-hmm. Muslims are looking at that and they're saying, ah, this is a fulfillment of the words of the Prophet that he said in the time of the Mahdi, they're going to kill and deport right. and, and get rid of every single Muslim or Arab that's living in their in their land. And, and so the expectation that the Sunnis have based on certain narrations where in the time of the Mahdi, and the return of Jesus, um, it is the Mahdi who frees Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And uh, as he's doing so, the Muslims chase down uh, uh, Jews and, and to the point, and, and God's trying to take vengeance back on the, the Jews to a point where even if there is a, a tree that a Jew is hiding behind, the tree calls out to the Muslim and he says, and he says, hey, I got a Jew behind me, come right, kill him. Right. Or if a Jew's hiding behind a rock, the rock will say, hey, Muslims, come over here. There's a Jew behind me, come kill him. You yeah. know, So it's like the earth is turning against uh, the Jews, even according uh, to the narrations. Right, exactly. And uh, you hear about these fantastic things that you would read about in a fantasy novel where the trees and the plants and everything is turning against the, the Jewish people, yes. So then you have the um, Shia version or the version from the Ahl Bayt Salam. Because when I use the word Shia version, some people, they right. get turned off right away and they think that it's just like, uh, you know, made up stories that mm. the scholars made. But I'm talking about 
narrations that are authentic that came from the prophet and his household right. instead of through the companions. And I wish Jesus the people listening of like would really pay attention to this because you're right, the word Shia immediately people turn away because of the, the, the connotations of the word itself, whereas the, the Sunnis themselves believe that the Mahdi is from the family of the Holy Prophet. And you're talking about narrations that stem directly from the family. So why would anybody have any resistance to that in their heart? And Shia is a positive term. It just means like a strong supporter. And in the Quran it says, and from his Shia is Abraham. Right. You know, so Abraham is a Shia, the prophet. So uh, it just means a strong believer, a strong supporter. And so um, we have over here Imam al-Mahdi in, in these narrations from the Ahl al-Bayt al um, He encounters actually a different type of enemy. Uh, than what is focused on over there in the Sunni narrations. Mm -hmm. And the enemy of the Mahdi or the Qa'im over here is Muslims. Right. That's his enemy. And those are the first people and those are his main concern. And it is those people, the Muslims, that the Mahdi of the Ahl al-Bayt salam takes vengeance against. Mm. And the narrations state that the reason why he takes vengeance against the Muslims is because of what they did over all these years by remaining silent and supporting the tyrants that were put into power that slaughtered his family uh, from the time of Karbala, even from the time of Amir Mu'mineen and, and the oppression of Fatima to Zahra all the way down. And so... This Mahdi, he comes and the hadith say that he has no more clear enemy than the scholars of Islam. Yeah. And he has a rougher time, a harder time with, with, with establishing the message than the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi had. So this confirms that the Mahdi does have a period where he's giving da'wah. And mm -hmm. the Mahdi has a problem uh, with the scholars because the scholars are issuing fatwas against him and he has a harder uh, time the narration state than Rasulullah did because it says that when the Prophet was sent forward uh, people were worshipping sticks and stones but when the Mahdi is sent forward everybody is interpreting the Quran everybody is a scholar now mm -hmm. and they're all telling him shut up you're a Dajjal this is what it means uh, the Mahdi doesn't know that he's a Mahdi and they're coming forward with all of these conclusions and interpretations uh, of the Quran they're saying that the Mahdi is not mentioned in the Quran altogether and so he faces mm -hmm. that problem that objection from the Muslim people. It's also clear that, that uh, from, the, from the narrations of the Ahl Bayt, that most of the Muslim nation is not Muslim. Uh, that they're all like apostates. They're, they're not real believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if they claim it uh, with their tongue. And the reason why is because if the Mahdi had only 10,313 real supporters, uh, real believers on the planet, then he would have emerged already. And so when he does emerge, when he finally, after he gives his da'wah and he does emerge, it is only this group of people that are the true believers. And um, he has, in some traditions, weapons that are buried in the ground. And he leads his companions to a certain point. And he begins to tap on the ground with his leg, and his companions, they dig out these, this armor and he tells his companions to wear it. And then he tells his companions to go forward and to slaughter everybody that's not wearing what they're wearing. Wow. Yeah. And it says that he slaughters 16,000 jurisprudence. Uh, in the area of Iraq. In Iraq, we know that it's primarily all Shia, and it's, it also specifically states that it's in these areas of Najaf and Karbala, where all of the um, Shia scholars are. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the Mahdi's primary enemy, even though he's weighted by the Shia, his primary enemy, first and foremost, is the Muslims and specifically the so-called Shia of the Ahl Bayt, those who are claiming to be Shia, uh, but they're following the scholars, but they're not real Shia. 
And uh, the hadith from the Ahlul Bayt say that the scholars of the end times are the worst scholars under the sky, and that from them came the fitna, and to them, uh, you know, it returns, mm -hmm. and that they it describes them as being traitors and uh, and filth, and it also, um, you know, uh, is is uh, very clear that they will, the scholars of Islam will follow in the same footsteps as the rabbis did when they rejected and they condemned Jesus. They'll do the same with the Qa'im. Uh, nobody will accept him except very few uh, true righteous working scholars. Um, and uh, they point out that the enemies of every single prophet and messenger and person appointed by God, first and foremost, was the scholars. And so the Mahdi over here, he begins his battles by cleaning up the Muslim world from all of the tyrannical filth and hypocrisy and scholars that are uh, issuing fatwas and damaging Islam and stealing in the name of Islam. And then he goes over to uh, Mecca. Uh, and the Sunnis believe that he appears in Mecca too, but in the traditions of the Ahl Bayt, he has a more important mission that he needs to do in Mecca. Uh, it's not uh, just to unite the Muslims around the Kaaba. Uh, no, uh, what the Mahdi is doing over here in the traditions of the Ahl Bayt is that one, he's cutting off the hands of the ruling family and he hangs it on the Kaaba mm -hmm. uh, so that everybody knows that they were the thieves of the house of God. And, and he establishes against them, you know, he implements against them this barbaric form of punishment, which is the cutting off the hands, even though he doesn't do it with other people, he does it with them because they are the ones that had cut off so many hands before. And he's talking specifically about the family of Saud that live in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. So he gives them a taste of their own punishment mm -hmm. and he rules each people by that which they believed in. So these Wahhabis, he deals with them in a Wahhabi way. And he, wow. he rules the, 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 the Muslims by the Muslim Sharia. He rules the Christians by the Christian Sharia. He rules the Jews by the Jewish Sharia. He doesn't force them to convert. And mm. one of the things actually that he abolishes is the jizya, the tax that was imposed by the Prophet Muhammad on non-believers, that if you're a non-believer, you have to pay taxes to live in the Muslim land that's more than the normal citizen. The Mahdi says no more of this. If you want to be a Jew, you want to be a Christian, you can be a Christian or a Jew, and you can actually... You, the the Islamic Sharia is not even going to be what rules you. Your law that will make for your area where you're living in will be your own law, the law of the book, and he will judge them by that. That will be the system of rule for them. And what do they want to? What do they claim they believe in? They believe in the the rule that Jesus brought with. Okay, then they examine what the rule uh, that Jesus brought with. What is the jurisprudence that Moses brought with? And those are the laws of the areas where the Jews and the Christians uh, live in. And uh, even if there's a Jewish or Christian person that's living in in a Muslim area, he gets judged by his own book. And so the mission that he has to accomplish in the Kaaba, though, is that he also has to destroy the Kaaba. And that's one of the most controversial hadiths that take, that, that is concerning, mm -hmm. uh, the Mahdi is that he, uh, is with his companions and they go forward and he walks up to the Kaaba and he takes an axe and he begins to demolish the Kaaba. The moment that he does that, lightning and storms uh, take place and winds are gushing and it, it's becoming a very scary scene. All of his companions think that the storm is happening as a result of him desecrating the Kaaba. And so everybody runs away from him, mm -hmm. you know. And then when they see him continuing to dismantle the Kaaba without being struck dead, all of them rush back to him. And it says that in those days, uh, you know, the one who reached the Mahdi the first, that's his rank and the one that comes out. So, so how fast you went back to the Mahdi will determine uh, your rank that you have uh, with, with the Mahdi. And he demolishes also 
all of these masjids that are built, that cost millions of dollars, that have all of these riches and gold and, and that were houses that were uh, empty uh, of worship. And he returns these houses of worship to its basic form where they didn't even have a rooftop. It was just an open uh, arena area where the Muslims could uh, pray in uh, something that's simple and, and, uh, and, and forbid the investing of great money uh, that could be given to the poor uh, on that. Uh, the Mahdi also, he uh, manages to, um, you know, be, he's extremely, extremely wealthy uh, because, and, and money is coming to him extremely easily, especially after the beginnings of his rise. Mm-hmm. And the Mahdi is extremely just and he gathers the people and he would tell them, you know, is this what you guys were shedding blood over? Is this what you guys were were not talking to each other over? And he'll throw the money in the ground and he'll allow people mm. to take from the wealth that was kept and stolen from them as much as they, uh, they need or as much as uh, they want. So he goes against all of the rich people in the system uh, of government and uh, and uh, you know all these uh, uh, traitor tyrants that are ruling the Islamic nation. He frees the wealth that they have hidden and he redistributes it um, amongst the poor people. So really, the scholars are against this Mahdi according to mm-hmm. to the traditions of the Ahlbayt. So anybody who's waiting for the scholars to issue a fatwa that the Imam is here. The Prophet Muhammad and his family, Imam Ali, Fatima and Zahra, they said, don't do that. It's a very bad idea to wait for the scholars because actually it's the scholars that are his enemy. You know, remember the story of Jesus. Remember the story of Moses. Remember the story of the Abraham and the, and the, and the priests uh, mm. uh, that were enemies of his, the idol worshippers. Same thing here. The scholars are idols that are being worshipped. They have to be broken. The Mahdi breaks them, eliminates them, just like uh, just like uh, Abraham uh, busted the idols in the uh, in the Kaaba, and just like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam did. And they fight against them, just like the priests and the rabbis fought against Rasulullah. Yes, I was like, I think some of your words will send shockwaves um, into the minds of those who are from a Sunni background, but yet at the same time, they believe that there is a problem at the time of the Mahdi that needs to be corrected, uh, specifically in relation to the religion of Islam. And uh, who can deny that the the uh, the thieves of the Kaaba, the family of the, the, the Saudi family, the ruling elites who charge extortionate amounts of money to poor people so they can spend their life savings in Hajj. And if they aren't the thieves of the Kaaba, I don't know who, who else could be. Um, so yes, there's a lot to uh, contemplate on. And uh, Yeah, the Mahdi from the narrations of the al Bayt, by the way, um, he does free Jerusalem too. Um, he does uh, free it. And uh, he establishes justice and rules over it. Uh, he just he's not committing the type of massacre or holocaust that's presented in the uh, Sunni narrations. Uh, he it states actually in many of the narrations that when he comes, he comes and he has with him the the relics that the Israelites they recognize. Uh, mm-hmm. So he comes with the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, he comes with the staff of Moses uh, or the rod of Aaron and he comes with the uh, ring of Solomon and uh, with these relics comes great powers and and just the mere fact that he has the Ark of the Covenant uh, it states that when the Jews see this um, they basically many of them uh, and some narrations state most of them they end up accepting uh, the Mahdi and, and believing in him after that uh, because, uh, you know, it's done. It's a done deal. They see that, you know, he's the inheritor of the prophets and the messengers and, and they know also from their, uh, from their, uh, the, the Torah and from the books of the, uh, of the prophets and the messengers that the Ark of the Covenant, uh, would sometimes stop in front of the house of the person that was appointed uh, by God, and they would recognize that and take that as a sign that the Ark of the Covenant's there in front of this house. So from that house is a great prophet, mm. you know, and 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 so uh, the Ark uh, having disappeared from them for you know two thousand years, even more than that, and reappearing with this individual, this is like the miracle of miracles uh, for them, and uh, and uh, yeah, so the Mahdi. 
becomes a very uh, loved figure and he rules uh, in stages and, and, and there's certain narrations which talk about uh, treaties that take place with certain countries and then treaties are broken. And uh, he's a character uh, that uh, Jesus, the son of Mary, comes down upon just like in the, in the Sunni traditions, although it does not state that, um, that he comes down hanging on the backs of angels, but rather he is the character who receives the banner uh, from Jesus, the son of Mary. So the suggestion is that Jesus, the son of Mary, was actually one of his supporters that was actively giving dawah uh, for him before his return. And then when he does return, it, the banner is handed over by Jesus, who may or may not have been known by the people. And the character of the Mahdi also, he appears alongside with the return of all of the prophets and the messengers. So all mm. of the souls of the righteous people that lived from the time of Adam all the way till the time of the Mahdi, they all return with him. And they uh, are the people that basically make up his uh, army. And uh, yeah, that in short is the uh, Mahdi in Islam uh, from the uh, traditions that were given by the companions and by the household of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. SubhanAllah. I, I, it's, a, it's an amazing, uh, there's a lot of food for thought there. And I think myself as a Sunni Muslim, growing up as a Sunni Muslim, uh, when you give this striking contrast between what the Sunnis, uh, their focus being more external and the eradication of the Jews versus the family of the Prophet, which is saying actually it's an internal problem that needs to be addressed first. And why wouldn't there be when uh, the people who claim that Imam Hussein is the master of the youth of paradise and he's getting beheaded by Yazid and the heirs of Yazid are the current uh, Islamic despots who are sitting on the throne in Saudi Arabia and in the Gulf countries and um, the scholars who protect them. It's always been a story of prophets versus priests and uh, I think you've completely laid it out for all to all those who have a clear conscience and, a, and an open mind can see the truth and it's been made very manifest today. Yeah, and I think we'll, we'll end on, on this conclusion and, and it's perhaps the most important one. And that is that the narration state that Islam started as something strange, that it will return as something strange, and that the Islam that the Mahdi brings is something which is almost unrecognizable to most Muslims. And so they have to be aware uh, of this fact. And uh, they have to uh, examine uh, anybody who's claiming to be the Mahdi or to be a messenger from the Mahdi because God does not want anybody to believe blindly, uh, but they should also not disbelieve blindly, because in it might be their destruction. Um, because everything that we know about the Mahdi and that was given already by the Prophet, by his holy, holy household, indicates that the Mahdi is not the friend of any of the Muslim leaders, and he is not the friend of of any of the scholars of Islam. He is only the friend of the oppressed and poor uh, Muslims who don't know any better and who follow him and support him in establishing uh, peace and prosperity. And, and obviously from these traditions, they, uh, the Muslims think that the Mahdi is a non-believer or he's a, he's a heretic because what he's saying is not uh, what the normal people are saying. And even some traditions state that they call the Mahdi a Jew, or they call him an Israeli or an Israelite. And so we, we must be very careful of all these warnings that we've been given and proceed cautiously. And over the course of our coming episodes, um, you know, we will be discussing a lot of topics uh, that pertain to the Mahdi because it is such a vast, wide ocean of knowledge that, that you can't fit it all in, in one episode. So today is just an introductory episode about the character of the Mahdi and preparing uh, our viewers for what's to come. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Fed. Thank you for having me on the setting. God bless you. Thank you.